Welcome everyone to the BAA Historical Section webinar. Um, just to let you know that uh, this webinar is being recorded and live streamed to YouTube and the recording should be available an hour or two after the end of the webinar once YouTube have done the processing. And I'll now hand over to Mike Frost, the Director of the BAA Historical Section. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Um, do I share a screen? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, well, welcome along, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Frost. I run the uh, historical section of the, of the BAA, uh, and uh, uh, every year we try to hold a, um, uh, a, a an annual meeting. And uh, when I started organising this, well, about this time last year, uh, it was going to be in the Birmingham Midland Institute in Central Birmingham, very very convenient location and a great place to meet uh, because it's also the home of the Society for the History of Astronomers' excellent Sir Robert Staywell Ball Library. Well, as we know, things have changed completely. Uh, we had a very good lineup of, of speakers. Um, uh, uh, Andrew Lound, uh, the renowned uh, 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 astronomy broadcaster, um, um, the um, uh, Clive Ruggles from uh, Leicester University on uh, archaeoastronomy and uh, Jeff Belknap and uh, 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 and a couple of other names that I had uh, ready, but of course things pretty quickly got in the way this year, and so uh, uh, in the middle of the year we took the decision that we were going to go online, uh, as with the rest of the BAA's output for the last nine months or so, we, we switched to a webinar, uh, and I have to say that you know, webinars have worked pretty well, uh, but uh, I I don't know about you guys, I'd sooner be uh, I'd sooner be meeting for the day in the in, in in Birmingham, so we can say hello to each other. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we are where we are. So, um, uh, if I may start with uh, a, a few parish notices, um, uh, Andy. Uh, uh, now, from the beginning, let's try that again. Uh, Andy emailed me the other day to say that um, uh, he was uh, himself moving online. Uh, he's giving a series of uh, of, uh, of webinars. Um, uh, on various subjects, he doesn't just uh, so doesn't just lecture on um, on astronomy. Uh, he's also giving talks on the, the history of the Titanic, which he's a he's well known authority on. Uh, but the one he thought we might be interested in is on is on the Mars Odyssey. Um, Andrew Lau, Mr. T Talk Radio's Mr. Spaceman, Zoom presentations with his images, music, and video. Uh, Andy is a, is a superb and a natural performer. Uh, I really hope that we will have a, a we'll have the meeting again next year in in the BMI in Birmingham. Who knows what will have happened by 2021? But uh, 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 we will get Andy to you sometime and to give one of his uh, one of his uh, talk is is uh, it doesn't do it justice. Is a, a audio visual spectacular, perhaps better now. Um, Mike Bryce uh, asked me to uh, to uh, mention uh, uh, another fascinating looking uh, uh, talk, the uh, Myths and Legends of the Stars by uh, 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 Valerie Calderbank, who's uh, uh, had led an interesting uh, career in uh, nuclear physics and computer science and so on, and then moved in, in recent years, moved into very successfully into astronomy. Uh, and so she'll be talking about the myths and legends of the stars uh, as a Zoom, uh, Zoom webinar uh, uh, through, through, the, uh, through Mike's uh, ghostspacewatch.co.uk. Um, uh, so, that, that looks really interesting, that Wednesday, this uh, 2nd of December, and the lounge is, uh, is a week or so after that, December 19th. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our next BAA meeting, the BAA Christmas meeting. Uh, I don't know about you guys, it's my favourite meeting of the year. It really is great to uh, to go down to London for Christmas. Uh, I know people, some people go do the Christmas shopping in the morning and then uh, and then join the meeting in the afternoon. Uh, this cannot happen these days. We will. Uh, uh, last year's was really excellent. We had uh, uh, um, Mark Kidger from the European Space Agency and uh, Emma Bunce, the uh, incoming president of the RAS. This year, uh, we have Dr. Emily Brunston uh, from the York University Astrophysics Department on fantastic planets and how to find them. Uh, we will then of course have the uh, of, uh, have our sky notes for the Christmas period. Uh, so uh, uh, I hope we, uh, 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 we uh, last year's was uh, was uh, was put onto the YouTube channel with uh, with some success. This year it will be a webinar uh, and uh, and also available on YouTube. So uh, I hope you'll join me to to watch that one. I, I, it promises to be a really great day. So um, I will hand back to uh, if I do a stop share now, and I will hand back to Andy uh, to, uh, to pass you over to our speaker for, to, for today. 
Uh, this is um, uh, Dr. Jeff Belknap of the uh, of the uh, uh, Museum of uh, uh, National Media and Science Museum in Bradford. Uh, Jeff has uh, I'm reading up on his CV and it's quite impressive. Uh, he has a PhD uh, on the history of the analysis of photographic images from the British Periodical Press in the late 1800s. Then went on to Harvard University. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Leading a team of graduates in the study of Charles Darwin's personal correspondence and use of photographs at the time Origin of the Species was being produced. Uh, he then worked at uh, Leicester University and postdoc position and at the Natural History Museum uh, down in London uh, with, uh, with um, um, uh, assignments to uh, the Yale Center for British Art in Connecticut and the University of Nairobi. So uh, he has packed a lot into, into career so far. Uh, four years ago, he became the uh, curator of photography and photographic technology at the, uh, the National Media Museum. Uh, and is now head curator at, uh, the, at that location and head curator of the Science Museum Group. So, talking to us about the early history of astrophotography, Dr. Jeff Belknap. That is great. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, for, for a very kind introduction. Can you just let me know that you can see uh, my slide? Yeah, it's going well. Thank you. So uh, thank, thank you again for um, what a generous uh, introduction. Um, I hope my, uh, my talk here today um, uh, proves valuable to that, to that introduction. Um, thank you as well, both to Andy and to Mike to uh, welcoming me to give this talk. I would have loved to have been able to come down to uh, Birmingham uh, to, to give this talk, but you know, COVID gets in the way, I suppose. Um, but actually I think uh, this kind of venue is, is the perfect venue to, um, uh, share for a wider audience um, some some wonderful images, hopefully over the, over the next um, 35, 30 to 35 minutes. So what I want to do um, in this presentation is give you a bit of a, of a canter through, I suppose, or a little bit of an overview um, of how important photography became to uh, astronomical observation, to astronomy more generally throughout the 19th century, because I am um, a historian of photography and science, particularly in the 19th century. Um, but then obviously we can't ignore the, the 20th century and the implications and, and changes that happened there. So, so a little bit of an overview of this, this importance of the early history of photography and um, astro, astrophotography. I'd also be, I suppose, remiss um, if I didn't point out how important, how great grateful I am to actually come and speak to the BAA. Um, the BAA as a historical society actually was a really important aspect of my, my PhD itself. Uh, in a general overview, I, I looked at how um, photography became increasingly important to a variety of different sciences and, and thinking about the difference between professional and amateur practice um, in the 19th century. And obviously the, the, um, the makeup and invention of the, the BAA um, towards the end of the 19th century was a really crucial moment in that. So it actually played an important historical role in, in my PhD, which I'm, I'm happy to, to talk a little bit about later uh, if anybody was interested. So um, the rest of this talk is uh, giving you a bit of a uh, visual overview of, of uh, some of the really important moments um, and some of the important aspects of uh, photographic development and its relationship to photography. Now, I think um, mo when most people think or, or talk about photography, they talk about it as this invention of a moment of objectivity that it kind of, uh, some people end up talking about in a way that says photography overtook all other forms of observation, became the most important way we can analyze and visualize the world or scientific data. And ultimately that's, that's really not true. Um, other forms of visualization, whether that was drawing or painting or um, the things I'm most interested in, printing techniques, whether that's lithography or, or wood engraving, uh, became just as important um, and uh, carried on well past the invention and the, the, kind, of, um, the, the, the kind of maximum period of, of photography's importance to the sciences in the, in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. Drawing um, or other forms of, uh, eye to hand observation remained important, especially through, uh, in astronomy um, throughout the entirety of the 19th century. So whether that is the incredibly important work of, of Sir John Herschel and his mapping of, of the, the great nebula of Orion um, and how important his, uh, his work around um, drawing became important to that. And if anyone doesn't know um, Omar Nassim's 
absolutely wonderful work. Um, you should look into his his book, um, uh, Observing by Hand, which is just brilliant and describes all of that kind of uh, pre-photographic work around drawing. Or whether it is uh, wonderful people like uh, the astronomer James Naismith, who is working with photography, but is um, actually looking at um, using uh, models and recreating um, uh, painting of, uh, uh, of uh, so hand to eye and then making a wonderful gigantic um, painting, as you see on your, your right hand screen here, which we're lucky to have in, in the Science Museum group, or uh, Etienne Leopold uh, Trouvelot's um, series of lithographs of his observations um, of astronomical uh, phenomenon throughout the 19th century. So um, other forms of observation become increasingly important uh, to, to astronomy and don't ultimately die out. Um, so photography, despite being a historian of photography, doesn't just take over everything. That being said, photography does change a lot. I think, um, you know, one of the most important points for me here is that um, the kind of invention of photography in uh, 1839 um, is, is an important shifting point for sciences uh, more generally in the 19th century as well, particularly for astronomy. Um, it changed how um, uh, astronomers could observe what they could observe and um, how they could then use uh, images as data. So how you could um, capture information and uh, shrink it down to something that could be analyzed and ultimately communicated. Um, William Henry Fox Talbot's work here, so this is uh, his lattice window uh, image, which is the famous first photograph, which we're very lucky to have in the Science Museum group, um, became a, a big shifting moment. It became a moment at which um, observations could take place in, in uh, or could take form in different ways. Um, this is, I guess, the, the genesis of photography's increasing importance um, uh, or the start of its importance to, uh, to the sciences and particularly to astronomy. It also, um, I think, crucially, at least for my, uh, what I study is the forms of uh, visual communication. So how photography becomes a mode through which um, scientists or um, uh, lay practitioners or anyone really um, is able to share and communicate information, whether across the UK or across the world. It actually fundamentally transforms how quickly, how easily, and in which ways we can capture and transmit information. That to me is actually um, the most fundamental uh, fundamentally important aspect of photography, not just what it visualizes, but what it allows us to do with those forms of visualization. And really, that is the significant shift um, that happens with the invention of photography, not just with, with uh, Talbot, but uh, as you'll see with other um, co-inventors at the same time. So I'm just gonna put my cards on the table. Uh, rather than um, talking you through, I'm gonna give you a very specific history of the, um, the invention of photography and its early importance to astronomy. I'm going to tell it to you from a museological perspective because I am a historian of science. I have worked in universities. I, I have worked in archives, but I have also recently shifted to becoming a, a curator and, and now head curator. So um, the way I think about objects is actually, uh, the way I think about histories has shifted uh, quite a lot. And I think about how those objects sit in important institutions and the histories that they end up telling by sitting in those important institutions. So most of the images, um, actually all of the images that I'm going to share with you over the next little while come from, uh, from museums. A lot of them will come from uh, the museum group that I am very lucky to work in. So I work in the Science Museum group. Um, I work uh, in the image on the below left, the National Science and Media Museum. Um, which has changed its name a number of times over the years. It, it was originally opened in 1983 as the National Museum of Photography, Film and Television, then became the National Media Museum and in 2018 became the National Science and Media Museum. Uh, it is um, one of the most important repositories for photographic history in the world. Um, we have 3 million plus photographs um, as well as the, um, the William Henry Fox Talbot collection, um, uh, the largest collection of William Henry Fox Talbot's uh, photographic work. Um, but we are within a network of museums. So um, the Science Museum, the National Railway Museum, and the Museum of Science and Industry are all part of the conversation, particularly around um, the histories of image making, particularly, and, uh, and the histories of photography. And all of these, uh, despite the fact that Bradford is um, a repository or a very strong place for photography, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist in our, our other sister institutions or have very important histories in those other places. One of the things I, I love most about photography as a subject 
um, is it's everywhere. It's in almost every single library, every single museum, every single site, probably in every single one of your house, uh, houses, um, somewhere there, there is photography. And I'm sure um, you are all photographers in some way or form. Um, so it plays a really critical role. Um, and my role is to try to understand um, the importance of photography in all of its different instantiations, whether that is the amazing work of a photographic chemistry of John Herschel in his notebooks on the top left, or uh, Benjamin Dancer's um, uh, mid 19th century uh, investigations into to microscopic photography, or um, uh, which are which are which sit with the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester, or the um, hundreds of thousands of photographic images of trains uh, that are um, uh, that sit in the National Railway Museum. It is actually uh, it might be surprising to to some of you one of the largest uh, repositories for photography in the UK uh, because of the importance that um, uh, it. it photography increasingly played in the documentation and uh, dissemination of, of uh, rail history and rail phenomenon. However, I digress. Back to photography itself and to the subject of this talk, the role of photography in, um, uh, in astronomy. So uh, with the invention of photography in 1839, uh, we tend to think of it in um, two competing forms. There was William Henry Tal Fox Talbot's invention of the paper process, and then um, almost simultaneously was uh, Jacques-Louis Jean-Armand uh, de Gure's uh, um, metal process called the daguerreotype. Um, what we tend to forget sometimes is that photography takes form in lots of different uh, material processes. Um, so it isn't just paper. Paper uh, became, I suppose, the most predominant form, the positive and negative form, um, the, the, the ability to ha ha capture an image um, on a flat paper surface that looks the opposite of what we ultimately see it as. Um, but from the very start, uh, photography or photochemistry was experimented on, on, on multiple different um, uh, material formats. Glass becomes, as you'll see through this presentation, glass photography becomes one of the most important and predominant forms of uh, photographic practice and materials for us, particularly for astronomy. Um, we, we usually think of the invention of, of uh, predominantly glass photography, so the, the uh, main use of glass photography from uh, the 1850s onwards. Uh, but people like John Herschel were actually experimenting and um, demonstrated uh, uh, the ability to capture an image on glass from almost exactly the same time, or just you know six months later than, than William Henry Fox Talbot and, and, and de Gure, um, particularly by capturing um, one of his 40-foot telescopes that he was using in Slough. So this is actually um, one of the very earliest images uh, of an astronomical subject. And I think that's also something I, I want to get across in this talk. Um, when we're thinking of astrophotography, it's not just images of the heavens. Um, in the earliest form, it was actually all of the things around us, all of the things around um, these experimenters, mostly these chemists in this early period. Um, it was taking pictures of instruments and apparatus and locations. That's where photography was first mainly applied um, and then was developed as a tool of observation for the universe, for the moon, the sun and, and, um, and the heavens more generally. Um, so it, uh, part of the reason I wanted to, to show this slide is because it's um, it glass becomes important, increasingly important, um, as we'll see um, shortly. But going back to, uh, to Talbot, um, Talbot actually, so the inventor of photography, wasn't actually that interested in astronomy himself. Um, he's generally primarily known now as the inventor of photography, but he's much more interesting than that. He was a uh, really a polymath, interested in lots of different sciences, from philology to mathematics, uh, obviously to, to chemistry. Um, and when he applied his, his other sciences to, uh, to photography, it tended to be looking down rather than looking up. Um, so he was much more interested in microphotography. Um, so this, this image um, of, the, uh, of the stem of a plant um, is one good example, but he did a number of different experiments with his solar microscope um, and applying his, his uh, photochemical process. Um, so Talbot um, didn't actually do any uh, that we know of, um, any photo astronomy, um, wasn't particularly interested in looking at the stars. If we want to look at the very first example of an astronomical subject um, made by a photographer or, I mean, in this very early period, we're talking about 1839, 1840 period, um, it wasn't, a, you know, the, the term photographer really didn't exist. It was mostly just um, chemists playing around with imaging techniques. 
Um, and there were lots of them going around at this period. There was lots of competing processes, lots of competing um, chemical solutions, um, lots of different materials. Um, you have to look actually over at America, particularly in New York, to find um, the first successful image of an astronomical subject, and that is John William Draper, um, who was a, a chemist uh, working in New York, um, and his image, his daguerreotype of a moon. And part of the reason he's using um, a daguerreotype is actually the, um, uh, the invention of photography um, uh, in its paper process was much more successful in Britain than it was in America. Um, the first and largest in um, uh, use of photography was in, in the metal process and daguerreotype process um, in, in the US. And actually that lasted for, for a good percentage of the 19th century. You, you found a lot of um, daguerreotypes in, the, in, in America, uh, much more so than, than you found in the UK, primarily um, because one of the um, uh, American uh, Samuel Morse, who, who invented the Morse code, who was, is a very interesting uh, character, was actually in Paris when, when um, the, the daguerreotype process was announced. And he brought that information back over um, to the United States and shared that with people like, like Draper, who then uh, continued to experiment with it. So if you're looking at the US, you will find images like this, um, daguerreotypes most likely in the early 19th century. For photography to become more widely used to, um, to identify and, uh, and look at astronomical subjects, however, we have to, we have to really wait until the 1850s. Um, throughout the 1840s, there's lots of experimentation with different forms of, of chemistry, uh, but it's not until about 1851 that you get um, the invention of what's called um, the wet plate collodion process by, by Frederick Scott Archer. And what this allows um, photography to do is become a lot more stable and the chemistry to become a lot more sensitized. Uh, so uh, Archer invented a process whereby you could um, uh, put your emulsion uh, on a clean glass plate, use actually this camera uh, that he used here, uh, and create a, a stable and reproducible and quite detailed uh, image of any subject uh, that you were looking at. So for um, photography to ultimately become replicable, practicable, and useful uh, for a variety of different sciences, particularly astronomy, which um, has you know, lots of different site requirements, has lots of different environmental requirements, whether that's cold upper air um, observation or in hot climates, um, you need to have a bit more of a stable uh, chemical subject in order to be able to use that and to um, replicate that. Because I think one of the things we have to remember is this is a, um, photography in this period is a, is a very heavy process. It's a very complicated process. It's not just taking a camera and, and shooting, it is bringing an entire photo lab with you, an entire chemistry lab with you. Um, so this camera here is a good example of that, where the chemical solution was actually produced in the back of this camera, which is why you have these, these slightly strange looking uh, holes in the left hand side. That's where you put your hands in and actually manipulate the, 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 the plate and create the, the photochemical surface for your plate. Um, so, but this is a really important moment for uh, the um, increasing importance of photography to, to astronomy because it allows for um, images and work like this. Um, so this is Charles Piazzi Smythe, um, who I assume all of you know, but if you don't know him, please go and look at him. He's, he's just an absolutely brilliant um, historical figure. He is the Royal um, Astronomer for, for Scotland, uh, working out of the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. He does lots of wonderful astronomical expeditions around uh, to the pyramids to measure the pyramids, as well as this um, expedition in the 1850s. 50s and 1856 to Tenerife. So particularly, um, Piazzi Smythe is interested in um, demonstrating the ability to do mountaintop observation. So to be able to bring telescopes to the top of mountains, um, clear away all of the um, atmospheric debris, I suppose, of, of 19th century um, industrial, industrial complexes, um, and be able to create clearer and better observations of the heavens. To do this, um, uh, Piazzi Smythe um, takes an entire expedition out to, um, to Tenerife, particularly looking at this mountain, Mount Gujara. And it is more than just an astronomical um, expedition, it's a photographic expedition. He takes hundreds of photographic images, including um, images, stereo images, so left and right images that, that can create 3D, 3D images um, of all of the, the uh, telescopic instruments, the setup, the, uh, the set of people that are working to, to do this, as well as actually one of his important subjects, which is Mount Gujara, which is this, this image on your right. This becomes, um, so this isn't just a story of uh, Charles Piazzi Smythe, but it brings us back um, to, uh, to the importance of William Henry Fox Talbot. 
Talbot, um, as I said, wasn't interested in astronomy, um, was actually stopped doing photochemistry after, um, after the 1840s, essentially, because he felt that he kind of reached the limits of what he was able to do. And by 1850, I became interested in an entirely different subject, and that was the ability to, to, to turn a photograph, a photochemical image into a photo ink image, so a printed image, ultimately. And he, he created two patents that he called his photoglyphic process. Um, that are actually the precursor to offset lithography, essentially, to be able to turn a photochemical image into an inked printed image. And, and why this was important is because photography um, was really hard to share. So photochemical images were hi hard to share on a very wide scale. You couldn't just print them um, in newspapers or in reports without some kind of interlocutor, whether that was a wood engraver or a lithographer, someone to recreate and copy the image ultimately. And for astronomy and for, for some sciences that were interested in the very particular importance of how an image described a space or how it identified certain um, uh, data points, um, exact replication was really important. So Talbot um, here works with Piazzi Smythe to create a uh, photoglyphic engraving of his, um, of his image of Mount Gujara. And why this is important is because for Piazzi Smythe, it's not just the, um, the astronomical expedition itself or the findings, but it was proving the value of those findings to his funders, ultimately, um, to the Royal Observatory, because he needed to be able to demonstrate that this was good and important work to continue to be able to do. And in order to do that, he actually creates a um, essential photographic manual within his annual report and reproduces um, some photographic images, as you see here, to demonstrate how important his expedition was and how successful it was. So the place Talbot plays in this is um, using his newly invented and newly inv uh, patented photoglyphic process. Um, so to me, this is an astronomical image. This is as important um, as, as some of the, uh, the early Draper images or the Herschel images or some of the images you'll see um, very shortly. These are the images of astronomical. These are as, as important to the images of astronomical science as anything else, because they are all about um, the, the creation maintenance and dissemination of an astronomical network, um, the ability to communicate this information across time, because I think this is one of the other things that we tend to think about photography is that with its invention, it becomes mass reproducible, it becomes something that you can send out pretty quickly and pretty easily. And while that's certainly true now, you know, the, the consumption of images um, through digital formats that we, we have now is on a scale really unimaginable. And that is one of the key aspects of photography. But, but in this period, um, it was actually um, quite difficult to, um, to scale up photographic reproduction. You could print copies, you could print maybe five to 10 quite easily. But if you're getting up into kind of hundreds or thousands, um, you need a whole industry around that. And, and really, that's the whole history. That is one of the most important parts of um, the history of 19th century photography is how it becomes industrialized. Uh, and the reality of that history is that it doesn't really properly become industrialized until towards the end of the 19th century, especially coming back to, um, to Frederick Scott Archer's technology, the ability to have uh, a glass plate or a form of reproduction, a form of photographic technology that allows for, um, for reproduction. The other side of that story is, is this story, which is um, William Henry Fox Talbot's photoglyphic process, the ability to take an image, turn it into something that's not photochemical and, and still have um, photo verisimilitude. So the ability to trust that that thing is as we see it. I think that's, that's a lot of debates around photography in the 19th century. That's a lot of debates for astrophotographers in the 19th century. So how reliable is photography? Can we trust that what we're seeing through the telescope and what's being captured on the, this chemical plate um, is as, um, as we see it through the telescope. Can we reproduce it? Can we measure it? Can we identify specific subjects? And ultimately, are they reliable? So glass, um, as we canter through the 19th century and into the, the 1850s, glass becomes increasingly important um, for the industrialization of, uh, of, of astronomical scientific practice. So um, one of the key characters here is, is a, another one of my favorite historical characters, Warren De La Rue, um, not only because the De La Rue company is the, the, the same uh, printing company that is now printing um, 
the British passports in France, uh, but because De La Rue is such an interesting character, he is a stationer uh, working for his father's company. He's also a chemist, a photochemist. He is um, interested in astronomy. He's interested in photography. He's interested in lots of different subjects. And he's also um, the first person to properly image or photograph uh, a total eclipse. So in uh, 1860, um, using this diapositive uh, photo or an example of this diapositive photograph that you have on the right hand side um, of his observations in northern Spain of an, of an eclipse. Um, he produces his 1860 Bakerian lecture at the Royal Society um, demonstrating um, the uh, solar corona essentially uh, that is a bit you're able to observe um, during a solar eclipse. But this requires um, new adaptations in photographic technology and it requires um, again the importance of, uh, of Archer's glass plate photography. So what you see on, on the left here is a Dalmayar photoheliograph that's essentially a big box at the bottom of this long telescope. So on the right hand bottom side um, that is a um, essentially a camera that is a plate um, mechanism that you can put a glass plate in make your exposure through this uh, through this telescope uh, and then be able to uh, develop and print that um, elsewhere. Um, we're in De La Rue's uh, invention or his, uh, not just his invention, his observations become, I think, increasingly important to how um, uh, photography is applied to astronomical science, science, subjects um, throughout the rest of, of the 19th century, particularly because of the work that um, De La Rue and others continue to do on a regular basis, um, particularly at Kew Observatory. So the very same Dalmer uh, photoheliograph is brought back to Kew and is used to make um, daily and regular observations of, of sunspots uh, and uh, both um, regular observations, but regular photographic observations uh, of sunspots. And this becomes um, not just a, uh, a single observation or a single set of observations, um, but a set of regular sustained um, photographic observations that, that start um, being applied at different uh, observatories uh, at Kew, uh, later at, uh, at Greenwich, when they get their own heliographic department and other observatories, whether that's in, in uh, New York or the Cape of Good Hope or uh, other observatories ar around the world, photography becomes embedded in the practice of observatory science um, throughout the, the 1870s and onwards. Um, and, uh, and images like this, I think, are a really uh, good example of that. The other um, really important application of photography, uh, particularly to uh, the observation of the sun, is the development uh, in the 1870s of solar spectroscopy and spectroscopy more generally. So, um, you know, being able to identify Fraunhofer lines uh, using photography, because ultimately a, spectro a spectroscopic image is a photographic image, it just doesn't necessarily look like what we understand a photograph to be. Um, it is much more data than it is representation. And that there's this really uh, blurry line in the 19th century between um, images that we can understand as images and images as science uh, or scientific data. Uh, and I, I don't want to argue that that uh, images like, well, actually, this is a, a wood engraving reproduction that you see on your left hand side. Um, become uh, less important or more important to to uh, astronomy. You know, uh, as important are images like um, uh, like Piazzi Smyth's uh, observations of Tenerife. Um, you know, images that we understand as representational objects. But increasingly, over the 19th century, photography be becomes uh, what we understand and look like data. I suppose. But it's also uh, important um, to note that uh, images of spectrographic lines like this are ha have to be tied to images of the sun itself. So uh, here's an example of uh, Professor Morton, who's an astronomer in New York as well, um, tying the um, uh, the spectroscopic, the spectrographic image here on the left to an actual photographic image on the right. Uh, and his ability to then trace lines on that representational image to what is happening on the, the, the spectrogram, uh, the, the solar spectrum image that you see on your left. Uh, so photography starts being applied to um, different chemical observations of the universe um, throughout the, the 1870s and, and onwards. 
this both has a prehistory and, and a post history. So the 1870s isn't the only moment um, where, where this happens. So again, going back to John William Draper, he is um, using a daguerreotype process to as well um, look at solar spectrums. He's not able to get, um, because of the uh, sensitivity of the daguerreotype plate and his observational method, he's not able to get um, the Fra Fraunhofer lines, uh, but he is able to at least um, start to demonstrate that um, the, the solar atmosphere has different chemical makeup. Um, and then later in the 19th century, you get, um, again, the increasing institutionalization and programmatic um, uh, experiments around, uh, around photographic uh, exposures with, um, with spectrum photography. So I'm, I'm uh, looking at an example of John Ereshid's um, series of long series of, of flash spectrum photography uh, in, the, in the 1900s, uh, which we're very lucky to hold in, in the Science Museum. So photography plays a large and expansive role, actually, uh, in astronomy. It plays a role in um, looking at sites and uh, creating expeditions. It, it plays a role in observing uh, the sun and the moon uh, and, uh, and, this, and the universe more generally, but it also uh, becomes a way of understanding the chemical makeup. Of, of the universe. Uh, and this becomes, uh, these, these sciences, specifically of uh, uh, spectroscopy, become increasingly important throughout the 20th century as um, all forms of science, but particularly astronomy, uh, move less to observation and, and more to, um, I suppose, chemical uh, makeup or, uh, or micro, microscopic levels of, uh, um, of understanding, uh, understanding the universe. One of the other, um, I suppose, uh, critically important moments for photography and astronomy in the 19th century um, and the increasing uh, expansion of uh, photographic networks and photographic um, uh, industrialization is the 1874 Transit of Venus expedition. This is um, the largest and uh, most important um, scientific expedition of the 19th century. It takes uh, at least 10 years to uh, develop. The, I know the, the BAA and the RAS um, constituents of, of, their, of the late 19th century play an important role in, in the makeup and the observations of the transit of Venus. I won't explain what the, the transit of Venus is because I assume all of you know what it is, but photography plays an absolutely critical role in it because the, especially for 1874, it is the moment um, when they believe photography and the um, increasingly sensitized and reliable use of glass plate collodion photography can allow for very, very minute observations of the disk of Venus across the sun using the exact, um, well, not the exact same uh, Dalmayer photoheliograph, but using Dalmayer as well to create five new um, photographic cameras, photographic uh, telescopes to be sent across to five different observation sites all around the world. Um, to capture photo uh, photographic images of the transit of Venus uh, in 1874. Ultimately, this is a uh, failure. Uh, it's a scientific failure because the images are successful. They have enough images um, to, to replicate, it, but the ability to do the um, minute measurements um, on these photographic images isn't enough to be able to give us a reliable form of parallax. Um, uh, so ultimately, um, they try again in 1882, but um, on a much reduced scale, at least for photography. This isn't the, so the image you see before there isn't the only, you know, this is a, um, a global network of observers working around the world. Um, so it's not just the UK that are um, uh, putting forward um, uh, their, uh, their expeditions, but also France and America and many other countries put forward expeditions. Um, the work of Jules Janssen, um, who again was uh, very important to the invention of, of um, spectroscopy, uh, is, uh, is also a, an important inventor of another form of photography for the transit of Venus, what he calls his Janssen plate, um, which is a series of photographic exposures around the edge of a plate to give you um, a serial uh, measurement of the movement of Venus across the sun. It's hard to see here, but as you can see, all of the images are, are small little exposures around the, the, the circumference of the plate, which, tell, which give you very specific differences of the ingress of Venus onto the disk of the sun. 
Um, this becomes uh, important, not just for astronomy, but also because this is a progenitor to the work of people like Edward Muybridge and Etienne Jules Murray, who um, are, are known for inventing instantaneous photography um, through their work, whether with, it's with birds or animals, uh, in, in the case of Murray, or horses with, with Muybridge. And ultimately, they, they are, are also um, given credit for kind of the invention of cinema, the ability to create very fast sequential and moving images. So all of these bits of work are actually tied together. Um, photography doesn't just sit with astronomy. Obviously, it has tendrils everywhere. And the work of people like Jansen or the work of De La Rue and others influence um, other forms of both scientific and popular uses of, of photography. So the use of photography and astronomy just gets bigger and bigger over the 19th century. Um, so this um, is really a, a good example of, of the colossal scale to which photography becomes centralized to the work of astronomy. So the, the Cartes du Ciel pro uh, project or the astrographic project as it's known um, is a large uh, multi-sited over 20 observatories around the world between 1891 and 1850, producing over 22,000 glass plate images of, uh, of the known universe. So being able literally to map the sky through photography becomes one of the most ambitious and long-standing um, uh, astro astronomic, I would say, um, projects as well as photographic projects throughout the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries. Um, and I suppose what I want to leave us off on is that um, this doesn't just end in you know, a lot of narratives around photography is that the 20th century ultimately becomes the century at which um, observation in astronomy becomes less and less important, you know, radio astronomy uh, increasingly becomes important or, um, you know, uh, now uh, the use of computers to be able to, to form our observations um, of, of the known universe. However, um, glass plate photography in, in continues to, to play a really important role in, in observational astronomy throughout the 20th century. And I think this is um, uh, demonstrated in the example of the, the DASH project, which is out of Harvard, the uh, Digital Access to the Sky Century project, which um, thankfully saved over 500,000 glass plate photographs of the northern and southern hemispheres um, produced between 1882 and, 18, and 1992. Um, particularly in Harvard, and uh, if, if I'm sure you all know this website, um, but if you don't, please go to it. You can look at pretty much any um, astronomical subject uh, produced in glass, uh, in glass plate photography throughout the 19th century. So this, um, I suppose what I want to leave you on is photography is not just a, a niche important subject of the 19th century. It is um, one of the most significant shifts in, um, in the practice of astronomy throughout the, the 19th and into the 20th centuries. Thanks, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Many thanks, Jeff. And for anyone who wants to ask, ask questions, um, the easiest way is if you're in Zoom, there's a Q&A button you can see at the bottom of the screen. And if you click on that, that will allow you to answer questions. They'll also try and keep an eye on the chat. And if you're watching via YouTube, then I'll keep an eye on the comments and chat there in case anyone has any questions. Uh, I, I'll, I'll read you on at this point. This is Mike. And I think Bill Barton, my deputy, you, you should also be online to, uh, uh, to, to pick up any questions that, uh, we, uh, that would be a, a interest in them. Great. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now um, so that we can just see everyone. Um, but I'm happy to show any image. I can share again if anyone wants to see. If you'd rather ask, less, rather than asking questions, if you want me to just look at some of the lovely images that I showed you, I'm also happy to do that again. Well, I've got loads of questions, but I, if I've got loads, then uh, then then so have other people. Uh, can I can I start off things? Um, um, uh, the the Harvard glass plates are absolutely central to the history of astronomy. I, I've been reading uh, David Sobel's excellent uh, book on the on the glass universe and also uh, the Cecilia Payne biography that just came out. You know, uh, uh, the, 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 to begin with, they were collecting the information and then they started using it to, uh, to, 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 you know, to advance our knowledge of the universe. Uh, was there anything special about the, the glass plates technically? Uh, were they better than everybody else's or was it just the fact that they were collecting so many of them and, and had such good analyzers? No, to be honest, there's not much uh, innovation in glass plate photography in the 20th century. Um, I mean, it's a, the, um, 
there's a lot of, uh, of development. So the, the kind of, that being said, there's a lot of development in photochemistry throughout the 20th century. You have industries like Kodak, Ilfracom. Um, so the, the producers of photographic chemistry throughout the 20th century become the big companies. Um, so, but it's really, the, it's really these moments in the 19th century towards the 1870s that you get much more, at that point you get pretty reliable glass plate photography. So Harvard's not doing anything with unique photosensitivity. What they're doing is mass uh, programmatic uh, uh, observation. And I think that's really the important bit here is that it's scale. It's just how much you have uh, is the ability to then have that as a just gigantic data set, a data set that is able to be correlated and investigated um, because, you know, one of the great benefits of photography is it's not just, it doesn't just encode data on one single image, you know, masses of amount of image of data within that image, but it's in its ability to show slight variation across all of these different, different, um, different instantiations, I suppose. Um, so I think that's, that's the, and this is the story of really 20th century astrophotography is its, its scaledness. I think the Carter CL project is a good example of that. Um, as of the start of that, but then it becomes importantly, uh, increasingly important. Um, I think there's interesting moments towards the end of the, the 19th century or the 20th century where we start thinking of collections like that as useless or not important because they're glass, they're heavy, they're old, they're old materials. Um, and we almost lose them because of that, I think. It would have been such a shame if we'd lost the Harvard plates. I mean, they, 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 it's it's a record of what was going on a century ago. So uh, it, it may have caught uh, it may have caught flares and astronomical events that uh, we simply didn't know about. You can go back and check how bright the star was in 1890. Absolutely. Um, so just uh, I'm going to answer this question here. So um, there's a question from Michael Omar that says, wow, um, how will physical artifacts increase the significance given that images are now digital? How will we preserve these digital ones for the future given that they are now not physically stored in the museums? It's a really uh, important and live question for museums right now. The honest immediate answer is uh, we're not sure yet um, because museums are very, very good at collecting physical things. We have an entire infrastructure for caring for, so our ultimate uh, purview is to be able to care for and maintain historical objects for as long as humanly possible. The reality is to do that for digital artifacts, it, it requires different expertise. You need an entirely new infrastructure that museums are now coming to terms with but you also need people expertise in order to be able to know the um, digital preservation formats. Um, so uh, working for the Science Museum Group, this is a very live question for us. So we're, we are, um, we have just, I don't know who they are yet, but we have just hired a um, digital preservation officer for the Science Museum Group um, to create what's our, what's known as our DAMS, well, not just to create, but to maintain and increase our DAMS process, which is our digital asset management system. Um, so watch this space, I suppose. Um, is, is, the, is the answer to that. Um, we can't, the, the other thing to say is we can't collect everything. And that's also the really important point now is um, there will still require curatorial selection uh, because we can't take in 16 terabytes of, uh, of astronomical data into a collection because not just is it, is it will become increasingly difficult for us to store financially or physically, but we, uh, that amount of data is just not searchable. You can't, you have to be able to navigate it. You have to be able to tell a story through it. Um, so ultimately, we're, we're, we're working on that. It's, we're working on that question now, but I, um, I think it will become increasingly important to museums, especially places like the Science Museum Group. And I think um, my colleague Ali Boyle, who was I think uh, also going to come and speak at, at this, uh, is uh, is our keeper of science and astronomy, and she's she's actively working on these kind of questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful we'll get Ali Boyle to come talk, talk to us at some time. She's much better than I am. So uh, you guys are in for a treat if, if, if you get her. Surely not. <laughs> uh, I'll ask a question if there's a, a, not any others at the moment. Um, with the sort of, I imagine glass plates are fairly stable and hard to store and relatively easy to store, but do you have any kind of issues storing and sort of preserving the kind of the later kind of more flexible type of um, images as well as kind of do the glass ones just degrade a bit over time as well? Yeah, all photography degrades over time. I mean, we uh, there are some uh, that are obviously more unstable than others. So the earliest astro the earliest photography, more generally, um, is very unstable. So Talbot's images, um, some of them aren't even fixed. Um, uh, so we have to be very careful with them. Um, 
the there is um, essentially the, there's a problem in the early 20th century with acetate um, and you know the ability the vinegaring um, and is also combustible photography um, uh, towards the end it, towards the middle of the 20th century you get much much more stable photography um, in its um, uh, non flammable nature and its uh, stability over time. The the interesting thing is though every single different format of photography has a different shelf life and has a different, uh, well, obviously chemical um, composition uh, have, has different storage needs. Um, so glass plates are tend to be fairly stable, um, uh, but their difficulty is they're heavy and they break easily. So um, we have to um, always be careful in, in storing them and how we store them. The other difficulty is um, not just how you preserve them, so whether whether you put them in a freezer, but um, how you separate them, so making sure they're not facing each other because the chemical emulsions are easily attached to each other and then they'll rip off um, if they're facing each other essentially. So it's um, there's a whole actually uh, group of people in the museum that are just dedicated to taking care of the, the physical storage of, of the collections. Um, so it's a long way around of saying all of them have different needs. And some of the later, uh, especially once we get to color photographic processes of the, the kind of 18, 1970s and onwards, those become also equally unstable because they're, new, they're newer processes. Um, so we have to be very careful with early color processes as well. Oh, hi, Lee. This is a question from Lee. Um, uh, Jeff, is the, key, uh, the Q photoheliograph still on display at the Science Museum? Ooh, you're testing my, so I will, uh, I believe it is, I believe it's in Making the Modern World um, in the Science Museum Gallery, but I will, um, uh, I will show my ignorance being um, more up in, in Bradford than I am down in London, uh, and for this last year I haven't had a chance to go down to London. So uh, yes, I believe it is on display currently in Making of the Modern World uh, in, uh, in the, the Science Museum's displays. Thanks, Lee. We, too, we should recommend Lee's excellent book on the Q Observatory. So, uh, oh, I, yeah, no, I know Lee well. We've, we've worked together in the past. And not a question, but a comment from Carolyn B on YouTube, which says she visited Fox Talbot's home at Lecoq Abbey last year. Mm. Great day out. Hadn't known he worked with John Herschel. Yeah, go to Laycock uh, as much as you can. Um, it is an absolutely brilliant um, museum and uh, National Trust site. Uh, if you, uh, the very first image I showed you of the lattice window, that is Laycock Abbey. Um, so uh, try to find it. I'm sure they will point you to it there. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, Talbot was part of a vast network of, um, uh, of scientists in, in the 19th century. And it was... Um, it was Herschel's, uh, so one of the most important um, uh, parts of Talbot's invention of photography is his ability to fix it. Lots of other people, including Herschel, had been, um, uh, had been experimenting with, with photography earlier on, um, but it was Herschel's suggestion to Talbot to use hyposulfate um, that uh, essentially allowed Talbot to uh, fix an image. So what, if, if any, do you, I'm sure there's lots of people out there that have done darkroom photography. So hypo, it's still the same thing. Hypo is, is, is what was um, the important part of, of Talbot's invention and his, his collaboration with Herschel is really important for that. Um, I have another, there's another question here from Michael Omar. Um, as a follow-up, do you make digital copies of significant artifacts like glass plates? Um, and so this compounds uh, the archive storage problem. Yes, um, so I'm going to answer that uh, now. Um, yeah, so one of the main uh, bits of work of our museum is to create digital records and digital assets. Um, the, the really, so one of the clear distinctions for us is, um, and this is, the, this is the really messy part of collecting in the digital age, is that we have physical objects we have photographic records of those objects, and then we have born digital photographs, which are objects. So the, uh, the things that are the photographs, the glass or a born digital photograph that we collect um, end up being things that we have to maintain and um, maintain for the future. Things that we use for putting online or for sharing, so our digital records, um, those aren't acquisitions. They're not things that we are, um, they are part of our infrastructure and we have to keep them, but we don't have as many responsibilities around them. So it, it is still a really big thing that we need to archive, but it's a different level of responsibility, I suppose, because once something is fully acquisitioned in the museum, that's when it becomes, we have to hold this for the rest of eternity, essentially. 
Um, a question from Gloria. Apart from Dalmair, uh, were any other makers important for producing instruments uh, used for astrophotography for, for, before World War I? Um, it's really a really good question, Gloria, and the honest answer is I'm not sure, uh, but I am, uh, I'm certain that there were. Um, so the scientific instrument makers, the optical instrument makers, particularly um, of the 19th century, uh, magic lanternists, particularly um, uh, making of optical devices, become really important um, throughout the, the late 19th and into the 20th century, because they are the technicians that know how to make the optical toys and, and, uh, and tools essentially that become really important uh, for all, all different forms of sciences. I'm sorry to not give you a more satisfying answer, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just not sure of the exact answer to that. Um, and another question from ACD, could you say a little bit more about the development of techniques for reproducing photos and books and journals for, for the late 19th century? Happy. So this is my this is my bread and butter. My I've, so I've written a book uh, about this called From a Photograph um, that is about the replication of photographic images in uh, in the press throughout the 19th century. So um, sure, the um, essentially to to mass reproduce an image in the 19th century um, mostly requires um, a printing technique uh, that isn't photographic. So until you get um, halftone photography in the 1890s, um, so the ability to turn a photographic image into a halftone image that is, you can then print um, with the roto uh, printing presses, you have to use either a wood engraver, so someone taking a photograph and literally carving with their eye that image into a wood block and then reproducing that. So some of the images that you saw in my presentation, particularly the, the images of the Fraunhofer lines, um, those are wood engravings, essentially, um, because that is the there's a big industry around that, and it's the cheapest and most effective way of reproducing a photograph. There's lots of lithography as well, um, which is a similar process, uh, but it's not a direct photographic process. But it, it's it, rather than it being on wood, it's on um, a polished uh, piece of stone and uses wax. Essentially. Um, uh, so essentially, yeah, it's not until you get um, uh, the introduction of halftone photography in the 1890s that you get um, uh, much more reliable photochemical images reproduced in ink um, in, in newspapers uh, and other forms of, of publications, whether that's Nature or the Royal Astronomical Society's publications or anywhere else. Um, and a really interesting thing for me is actually that the, the development of that is a, is a chemical development. It's a scientific development. Um, it's working with people like Talbot, who, who's, who's invention around photo, photoglyphic engraving, as well as a number of others, become key to the, to the use of um, the halftone image. I could talk more about that forever, but you probably don't have three hours. Um, so uh, let me go on. Uh, sorry, Gloria, if you have a question, you said you don't have a microphone, but if you wanted to, oh, sorry, you, you were just saying thanks, no problem. Um, um, now, another question from Jared Gilli uh, Gilligan. Um, was Isaac Roberts' work with long duration images um, use any improved methods to produce images? Uh, you know, again, I, I don't know uh, necessarily Isaac uh, Roberts' work, so I'd, I'd love to know more about that. Um, uh, I know the work around, um, uh, so 1870s is a, is a period, so the, part of the reason why the transit of Venus can happen is because of the invention uh, and, and the ability to create really sharp instantaneous images is because of the invention of dry plate photography. So this is um, a development from uh, Scott Archer's glass plate photography, um, but essentially what it uses is, uh, is gelatin to affix photochemistry on the top of a uh, glass plate um, pre-produced essentially so you can carry with them with the, you so rather than um, you can have a more reliable photochemical uh, surface but you can also pre-prepare them um, so that is kind of the important moment where you can start to get things like long duration images or instantaneous images um, and allow you to bring them into lots of different places so that doesn't necessarily answer your question but I, I maybe I'll go up and look look up Isaac Roberts after this because I'm, I'm not sure I don't know I don't know his work it's an excellent um, uh, deep sky imager from the, the 1890s or so. Okay. Had uh, a, a splendid argument with Edward Emerson Barnard over the, how, how deep they could go with it, phot photographing right, the, okay. the nebulae and so on. Uh, uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, do we have any questions on the YouTube, um, Andy? Uh, no, nothing other than that uh, one comment from Carolyn. If, if, there's, if there's nothing nothing coming in, I'd like to, uh, well, bring, bring the subject back to BAA members. Um, uh, what about the Hugginses? Uh, uh, William and, uh, and Margaret Huggins, they uh, uh, struck me that they were um, 
uh, uh, the, the, pretty early on, uh, people got to be able to uh, photograph the sun and bright objects, the moon and so on. But the Huggins's took on the much, much more technical challenge of, uh, of, of uh, getting spectra of very faint objects. Uh, what, what did they bring new stuff to the party, or was that uh, were they uh, bringing in, uh, working on the uh, uh, stuff that other people were doing? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a really I didn't get into it, but um, part of that image, so the the spectrum image that I showed you in the presentation. Um, was actually a very live and, and uh, vociferous debate in, in nature um, in 1873, uh, because uh, essentially there was a priority dispute between um, Jules Jansen and Norman Lockyer. So Jansen, as you know, is the, as, as I showed you the Jansen plates, um, and uh, Norman Lockyer, who was an astronomer and uh, an editor for Nature, um, uh, claimed themselves as the inventors of uh, spectroscopy, the ability to, to measure um, uh, the chemical makeup of the sun. And then there gets this live debate about the Huggins actually being, you no, know, the inventors of, of spectroscopy. Uh, and you get, uh, I think, actually, one of the uh, very important members for the starting of BAA, Richard Anthony Proctor, um, coming in as with strong defense to the Huggins, saying, "No, you, you know, you, you guys are claiming precedence when when the Huggins um, are are able, we're, we're actually the, the people doing this." And then you get people like Balfour Stewart coming in and defending Lockyer and Jansen. Um, so it's, uh, I think, you know, nature is a bit biased towards Lockyer. I think so. <laughs> they they claim uh, they lay claim to to Lockyer and Jansen. Um, but yeah, I know it's, it's a really, uh, and I, again, um, you know, Huggins is, is seeing as more amateur practice, I suppose. Um, whereas, uh, and this is a, this was a part of the really interesting work in my, my PhD is around this kind of schism in the 1870s and 80, 80s towards amateur and professional, when, when you actually start getting professional practice of astronomy. Um, and the, the separation out of, uh, of who counts as, uh, as professional, who doesn't count as professional, and, and um, uh, the invention of uh, spectroscopy and actually the transit of Venus, I think, become, play really important roles in that debate. And actually a role in the debate of the, 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 um, uh, the starting of BAA in opposition to RAS, you know, um, is, is part of that debate as well. Yeah, exactly. The comment says that uh, Lockyer was the editor of Nature, so <laughs> yeah. very important. Very important to be in control of the media. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, to, to, for my own mind, I say I, I, I'm, I'm very impressed by what Margaret Huggins brought to it. That she seemed yeah. to seem to bring the, the, the photo photographic skills to, uh, to to spectroscopy. Absolutely, and I mean, there's a, um, a very large. And people like um, Maunder as well, and his wife, uh, who were, were incredibly important. Were, I think it's Margaret? Um, uh, Annie Maunder. It's Annie Maunder, that's right. Yes. Um, uh, it play incredibly important parts of, of their photographic work, their photographic and their astronomical work um, in this period. I, I would also, uh, I, I've got three names down here. It's the Harvard Observatory, Margaret Huggins and John Evershed uh, for the, the eclipse photograph from uh, from 1900. Yeah. Uh, it was, was he the first flash spectrum? The first person to photograph the, fl the flash I, I spectrum? I think so, yeah. I need to look into, so we have the Evershed uh, archive in the Science Museum and I need to, um, I need to look into it some more. Uh, it's yeah. not in my collection because uh, <laughs> we, we separate them out. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a really big um, uh, and important uh, photographic archive. Uh, so I think so, yes. I, uh, the other reason, I, uh, uh, John Evershed's wife, Mary Evershed, was uh, my predecessor as the first director of the historical section. Amazing. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of both of them, but especially Mary. Um, just uh, a couple of points here. One uh, from David Sellers saying, "Excellent talk. Was there at, um, was there a stage at which commercial interests of the most uh, famous pioneers started to inhibit the development of superior processes?" Um, you know, it's a really interesting question because um, the the um, uh, photographic development always had commercial aspects to it. So um, Talbot is uh, part of the reason why you don't get. Um, uh, well, part of the reason why America doesn't adopt the positive negative process um, as widely as they, they adopt the daguerreotype process is because Talbot patented the, the, the positive negative process and daguerre um, had his bought by the state, uh, by the French state, so it becomes an open process. Um, so Tal the histories of Talbot essentially are the histories of trying to control the commercial um, value of photography, at least in England. Uh, and then there's other interesting stories like um, 
So Archer, who I, you know, is the inventor of the, the glass plate process, dies in penury essentially because the apocryphal story is because he decides not to commercialize on his processes at all. Um, decides to to let it be open and not patented and share it widely with the scientific community and the, the popular community. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of I think it's um, the really interesting thing with the histories of photography is there's um, you know it's not just one moment of creation. There's about 40 different moments of creation of photography over the 19th century that have patent moments and commercial moments and competing moments. Um, so it kind of is a, a long developing story where um, uh, people like Talbot are fighting their, their, their try to try to get uh, this patented and others are opening it up. Um, and then really the, the 20th century are, is a fight between um, the big industries, the, the photochemical industries. Um, so Kodak being a, a very important player, they're not just a um, photographic, they're not just producing not so, lots of nice cameras, but they are um, producing photochemistry. They are creating labs to develop the science of photography throughout the 20th century and that they're competing with others like Ilfracombe or Fujifilm later in the 19th in the 20th century. So it, there's loads of commercial interests. Um, if you're interested, uh, there's, a, there's a historian of science named Steve Edwards um, who writes around the, the kind of uh, business histories of, of photography, which is really interesting and really fascinating. Think that is there any other questions coming up? Nothing on YouTube. I've stunned everyone <laughs> into silence. <laughs> um, see from John uh, Mural, an important person in the 20th century was Charles Mees, who was a key player uh, in Watner and Rainwright in Croydon. Uh, and was headhunted by Kodak. Oh, that's really great to know. I have actually a PhD student right now um, who's working on the history of Kodak uh, because we have, the museum has the Kodak collection. Um, so Harold Croydon was a really big photographic uh, industry at Ratton and Rainwright. Um, and then Charles Mees becomes the, um, uh, the yeah, main photochemist in, um, in, uh, in Kodak, uh, in Harrow, and then actually um, invents and is, is one of the important people to establish um, the Kodak Museum, which is also in Harrow, which is a history of Kodaks and, and photography. Uh, and then again, there is, um, the, I can't remember his name, uh, so forgive me for this. Um, but there is also another person uh, hired uh, by Kodak at the exact same time that then ends up going to America and establishing um, the, uh, the Kodak Museum in Rochester, which is the other one of the other biggest um, photographic collections uh, in the world. Um, uh, Eastman House, uh, Eastman Museum it's now called. Interesting. I, I grew up right next to the Kodak plant in Harrow. I was like, end of the road, and I, we did wow. a school trip to the museum. Come to Bradford, you can see the entire collection, the Kodak collection, which uh, came up from Howard or Harrow in the in the eighteen uh, the nineteen eighties. Excellent. Um, I do uh, thank you, Jared. Please do come to Bradford. Uh, we're we're hopefully open on December third, so um, uh, please come up and and visit and view our collections. We have um, a, a collection center, and you can come and research the collections. Uh, uh, usually in the third week of every month, we have a research week. Excellent. I think that's a, a, a natural break point because we have any further, further open questions. Uh, so it remains for me to say, uh, well, thank one or two people. Let me uh, let me say, first of all, thank you to uh, Andy Wilson for uh, for running the webinar. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, he does a lot of work for the BAA. Uh, thanks to Bill Barton, who's been uh, very quietly recording the uh, the, uh, the the talk, so uh, that will uh, appear in the journal in due course. Uh, thank you to you all for, for coming in. Well, we had uh, uh, going on for sixty participants on uh, on uh, Zoom and uh, and more still on YouTube, so that's that's very good. But thank you principally, of course, to our lecturer, uh, Dr. Dr. Belknap. Thank you so much. I think you will get a stream of visitors up to Bradford when oh, uh, when no. Normal life resumes. Thank you so much. And a round of applause in, in that Zoom fashion. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Mike and Bill. <laughs>